CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. All right, we are starting the March 25th meeting for the Finance Committee, and we uh, have as guests today uh, representatives from the School Department and the School Committee. I will turn it over to the department to make the introductions, right. and then we will proceed. Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is uh, Liz Holman. I am here, superintendent, to present the uh, school committee's proposed budget for FY25. I want to introduce a few folks I have with me. Uh, to my right is Jose Farias. He's the assistant director of finance for the district. Um, in, as you might have heard, Mr. Mason has moved on to be deputy city manager in Chelsea. So um, he went on a, a parental leave earlier this uh, winter and has since resigned the district. So Ms. Perry and I worked on the budget proposal for this year together um, in partnership with Mr. Mason. He was still um, working a little bit during the leave and has now moved on to Chelsea. Uh, also, our members of the budget finance subcommittee, uh, Chair Len Carton, um, Chair of the school committee, Percy Alice Nancy, and Jenny Morgan. Um, and I also have two administrators from the district who I'd like to introduce, um, Wes, Wesley Pierre, um, is the Director of Communications and Family Engagement. That's a new role this school year. It opened the Welcome Center for us, and it's uh, the result of a reorganization at the central office. So we're thrilled to have her in that role. I'll also explain why she and uh, Fabienne Pierre-Maxwell, who is the principal at the Gibbs, are here tonight. They are part of a program called Influence 100 in the state. It's uh, run by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and that program is specifically designed to diversify the superintendency and senior leadership roles in the state. Um, it's been very successful at doing so. Uh, it's also developed in order to help districts spread um, equity practices and practices that improve outcomes for all groups of students across the state and to um, help leaders learn strategies that are specifically linked to the superintendency, but also linked to leading districts that are really strategic about equity work. So the, both of them are fellows in that program um, and are here observing uh, one of the things that people don't often get to see in the superintendency from within the system. So um, I'm really happy to have them here and made only a little bit more nervous by their presence. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, welcoming them as well. Um, I'll jump right into it, that's okay. Uh, so I'd like to start by talking about some of the priorities that are central to the FY25 budget that the schools have developed. Um, key among them, and of course, top of mind for us as we thought about everything we were doing this year into next year, was to make sure that we um, funded the override uh, commitments, specifically those tied to competitive compensation. This was uh, a key element of what we said we needed to prioritize in the strategic plan that we said we were going to prioritize as part of the override commitment to the town and was is really central, and you'll see that uh, in our plan for FY25. We wanted to make sure that we were ensuring adequate funds for what will be a 40% projected increase in electricity supply rate, which I'm sure you'll hear from other uh, town departments. This is having a really big impact on APS, considering we're also trying to be more electric. Um, and so when you have an increase to the supply rate and you are going more electric, you're going to have an increase to your overall rates. So we tried to account for that in our plan. Uh, we're adjusting elementary staffing levels to respond to what are some decreasing enrollments but we're trying to sustain and improve existing service levels in some other areas, particularly in areas of priority like special education. Um, we're maintaining our existing staffing for special education and expanding secondary enrollment. So we're not doing big additions at the secondary level. We're trying to maintain the staffing levels that we currently have. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some needs that have arisen in FY24 that we're just keeping into next year, as opposed to doing very many add-ons at all. Um, and then we're going to continue, of course, our implementation of the five-year strategic plan. So I want to begin by uh, demonstrating a little bit of where we're at with regards to enrollment, because this is a key component of the funding formula that goes into determining what the town allocation will be for the school system. So um, one of the main pillars, as you know, of the long-range uh, planning formula funds the town appropriation general fund of this budget has to do with student enrollment. So this shows the actual enrollment. This is the blue line from FY18 to FY24. And our projected enrollments from lots of different projections. So projections can be difficult. We've talked about this before for a number of reasons. We have to guess at 
Uh, we have to go and look at birth rates and whether or not those are changing. Uh, to some extent, we're guessing at vacancy rates and real estate state trends and sales and trying to assume what some of those are going to do over the next few years. We have to consider alternative education options. So our projections have given us actually a pretty good sense of where our enrollment's going to rise. Um, where if you look at the gray line right here, this is our in-district uh, projection. So this is a five-year weighted average, and we've tracked along with that pretty closely. The orange line is the McKibben projection. This is the best vendor projection we've gotten in terms of overall trend, but it, of course, didn't account for the pandemic dip. So what you see there in the blue, this is the pandemic dip in enrollment, and then it has tracked right along with that orange line following that pandemic dip, we've recovered a lot of the enrollment and we're starting to now see that overall we're leveling out. These two lines are from a projection that we got in FY22 um, from Decision Insight. And we have not gone back to them and I, I'm sure you can imagine why. And it's because they haven't, we haven't tracked very closely with the projection that we got from them. Um, so we're using right now a combination of the five-year weighted average, which is tracked pretty closely, um, and monitoring the McKibben projection at some point in the next couple of years might go get some more projections. But that's where we are with enrollment. Overall, it's leveling out. But I want to show you something that was not in the slides that you got for today, but it's worth noting. I think I can't, actually can't remember. Was this in the slides? Oh, it was. Okay, perfect. Good, because it's easier to see when I'm not sitting in front of it. Um, the blue line on this graph is grades K to 5 and the enrollment in grades K to five from FY15 through this year. And then the red line is enrollment in, in grades six through 12. And what you'll notice is that enrollment in secondary has only been rising. It has, it leveled off slightly. It has continued to go up. Um, so at the secondary level, we've only ever had more students over the last many years. And we've been trying to account for that and sort of proactively plan for that over the past several years. And I'll talk about that in a minute. At the elementary level, we saw that significant pandemic dip. We actually didn't see that at the secondary level. Um, and since then, it rose slightly and then has leveled off or is declining. And in, in between FY22 and 23, we saw those lines, those paths cross. And so what we're trying to account for now is that shift in enrollment, which is resulting in some reduced elementary sections for next year. Um, some maintenance of what we've already put in place at the secondary level while trying not to expand. Um, and we're going to need to keep uh, tracking this to make sure that whatever staffing levels we have in place and licensure levels, and that's important because licenses differ at the elementary level versus the secondary level. So you can't just move a teacher from the elementary level to the secondary level. They have to be appropriately licensed in their field at their level. And so you often need to shift positions eliminating some at some level, adding at the other level in order to make sure that you're accounting for where the students are and that the resources are placed for the student. Okay. So I want to go over a few things that are also key to our enrollment trends over the last couple of years. First is um, something that's in our strategic plan that is worth um, noting and tracking in addition to our overall enrollments, the enrollment of students in our focal groups. So APS identified five focal groups as the groups that we would keep a particularly close eye on when it came to outcomes, um, when it came to service needs, and when it came to, up to making sure that they had what they needed in school, because traditionally these groups have been underserved by the public school system. So they include students and the families and teachers of students who have IEPs, so special education, students, families, and staff who identify as Black or Hispanic Latino, and that is because Traditionally, the academic achievement gap for those particular focal groups of students has been significantly lower than their white peers. Students, families, and staff who identify as non-binary, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersexual, and asexual, or to put it much more shortly, LGBTQIA+. Um, students who are multilingual learners and their families, as well as students and families who speak a language other than English as their primary language in the home. And finally, students and families who are low income. And I mentioned this particular piece of the strategic plan because the, the students in these groups, their enrollment has been rising over the last several years. And often students in these groups, if you have more students with IEPs, if you have more students who um, identify as LGBTQIA+, and often that comes along with potentially uh, mental health implications, um, sometimes it can, it can result in increased bullying in the schools. This requires resources. If you're going to address it, you need the resources and the staffing to address it. So I just want to show you some of those trends. So this is the um, BIPOC or student of color population. And you'll notice that we have stable populations, students who identify 
as Asian and as uh, Black or African American, but a steadily rising population of students who identify as Hispanic. So that, that also includes students whose language might not be English, first language might not be English, um, and an increasing number of students who identify as multiracial. And then in this second graph, a steadily increasing um, number of students who are multilingual learners, students who have IEPs, students who come from income insecure households or who identify as non-binary. Overall, these lines are fairly flat, but they are increasing steadily. And Arlington is becoming more diverse as the years go on. And so with that comes an increased need for these students. And we have identified them as focal groups in the strategic plan, which means we are placing resources towards those needs and trying to shift and allocate resources to make sure that all of our learners get what they need in our schools. Um, that is because our theory of change is that if all of our students in focal groups see an improved experience, that all of our students are going to see an improved experience. And we've seen evidence of that at several of our schools, which I'm happy to talk about. So just in terms of numbers, um, we've been grateful for the investment in our schools. Our budget has increased year over year to accommodate the needs in the school department. Arlington believes strongly in uh, the value of its schools in creating a, a healthy community and a civically engaged community, which we appreciate. Those increased funds help us continue to provide at least level services to our students and to add positions as needed. This shows um, the four actual years of how we were funded and the projected funding source for FY25. So the local contribution uh, increases year to year as does state aid. The town contribution to the FY25 budget comes from both state aid from chapter 70 um, and from the allocation that comes from town revenues. And so that's represented in that black block. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things that is happening this year is we're seeing a reduction to additional revenue, grant revenue, because of the expiration of COVID-19. So notably, this is what we anticipate the percentages of each funding source in FY25 to be, and the town appropriation accounts for almost 93% of all funds in FY25. So our ability to do everything I'm gonna talk about is um, resting 93% on the fact that the town funds its schools in Arlington exceptionally well, which we are very grateful for. This chart demonstrates overall anticipated funding sources, including the town appropriation, um, and other sources of revenue. It's the same as the previous graph, just numbers wise. Um, so it shows the town appropriation overall, the local contribution and chapter 70, these two things make up town appropriation overall. Um, grants, COVID related grants, which you can see is going down by 880,000 this year. Special revenue and revolving, which you can see is going down. You'll note this is a negative number and that's not because we're in deficit on special revenue and revolving is because we're trying to spend down special revenue and revolving. So we're budgeting to spend down dollars that are in revolving if it has been carrying any dollars there. So that's also strategic, that's also purposeful. We're trying to use the resources that are at our disposal. Um, and circuit breaker, which is going down because our um, number of out of district enrolled students is also going down. So our spending on special education in the district is going up. Our spending on out of district funding is going down. Overall. We're keeping more of the kids in the district, which is our goal. Okay, this chart demonstrates the proposed budget expenses by budget transfer categories within the school department. Um, this is similar to what you've seen in previous years, but a notable distinction, and this might be a little confusing because it's a new thing in the school's budget, is this last line of budget contingencies. So there's a contingency budgeted line that in FY24 has $400,000 placed in it. That's the allocation that was agreed to this year for the school department to um, improve competitive compensation, particularly for unit D salaries in this fiscal year, FY24. Um, it hasn't been allocated yet, but I believe you all have a memo from Mr. Feeney speaking about this $400,000 allocation. So we placed it in contingency because otherwise it can cause some confusion on bottom lines. So that's what that 400,000 is. This 1.2, this is contingency because it's set aside for collective bargaining, which was our override commitment. But it's a combination of the dollars set aside for bargaining and dollars set aside that are tied to positions that will be eliminated, but we have not identified which position exactly will be eliminated because of contractual obligations. So we don't go through the position control and say, we're eliminating that teaching position. We've just said we're eliminating a teaching position um, because of a decrease in sections. And then what happens is we figure out who, like what the appropriate 
person is attached to a position over the next couple of months based on people leaving, somebody else can go and fill a role. Hopefully everybody who wants to stay in Arlington gets to stay in Arlington. So we place that in a contingency line. So that's a combination of negative dollars and positive dollars that were placed towards collective bargaining and negative dollars that are efficiencies that will come out. If that is confusing. I'm happy to try to explain it again. Uh, but that's what that is. Can I, could, uh, check as, as a member of the subcommittee, a simple explanation. Um, within their budget, they created their own Article 65 collective bargaining. The town does it in a separate work article. The schools are doing it within their budget. It's and it's it's when it was explained, Superintendent Mr. Carden used the exact language that the town manager uses every time this Article 65 comes across. It makes no sense to put expected raises against an employee's salary. Right? It's Tom Manager always says, we don't know how we're going to sell these contracts, but we know we're going to sell them. And so they just created their own Article 65, but they have to, be, by statute, do it within their budget. That's it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so I want to go over what some of our adjustments are um, from FY24 to FY25. So this is a high-level summary of our proposed changes to the FY25 school budget. Um, what you'll notice is that there is a significant increase in contractual obligations and salary adjustments. Um, that includes um, some of our, that, that includes any new positions that were added during FY24, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, it in, this, the second line is collective bargaining for unit A. So that's $1.7 million set aside for collective bargaining for unit A. If you combine this with the budget efficiencies here, a portion of them that we don't know exactly what position they're tied to, then you get to the 1.2 million that I was talking about on the other page. This unit D FY25 increase of 344,000 represents increases in salaries for unit D employees compared against what their original contractual agreement would have been prior to an MOA that we agreed to in December of this year. So we increased our TA salaries as soon as the override was passed. Um, given the $400,000 commitment to the schools that had already been agreed to, we went back to the table with unit D and significantly increased our paraprofessional salaries or some of our lowest paid employees um, in the district. And so that difference mm -hmm. right there, that 344,000, that is the difference between what we would have otherwise paid them. And it also subtracts out that $400,000 allocation for FY24. Okay. So it, it, it assumes that 400000 moves forward into next year's budget. So it's accounting for that. So this is what we would have otherwise not had to budget for had we not gotten the $400,000 allocation and we would have stayed on their previous contract. Um, then there's a utility increase. Like I said, our supply rates have significantly increased. Budget department adjustments. This is only a 2% increase adjustment on department budgets for next year, which will be tight. Um, but we've only adjusted up by 2%. Uh, we are going to make as much do with what we have. We're doing a curriculum rollout. We're going to use our internal resources to do a lot of the handouts and stuff for that. We're going to purchase the trade books associated with the curriculum rollout uh, in order to make a 2% adjustment work because the cost of supplies has gone up pretty significantly over the last couple of years as well. Um, there's proposed budget efficiencies in the form of positions, which I'll talk about in a moment, as well as some additions that I will also speak. So I wanna talk a little bit about ESSER 3 because this is a significant source of funding in previous years that we're losing as we head into FY25. So we're maintaining some roles from ESSER 3 that we had in place this year um, as trial positions. And we're also eliminating some roles that we had in place as trial positions. And I'll talk about why. Um, we did have a diversity, equity and inclusion specialist in the district um, this year that we are maintaining a director of research data and accountability, which we are maintaining uh, AHS Director of Counseling to oversee mental health services at the high school, which we are maintaining, and a communications specialist at the level of 0.6. We had a full-time communications specialist this year. We're maintaining 0.6 of that. Um, these roles are increasing administrative support to the high school at a time of growing enrollment and specific to supporting student mental health, which we think is very important at AHS. Um, we are in trying to increase our capacity for teaching and learning and keeping really functional data systems because this is tied to our MTSS goals, making sure that our, um, our services that we're providing students are grounded in 
strong data. That's why we need a director of data and accountability to maintain all of those data systems as well and to provide transparent data reporting to the community, the school committee, um, and to our teachers. And we're trying to increase support for professional learning and consistency in communications to families and staff. These are priorities from our strategic plan. So we're maintaining those, um, but we're also eliminating some of the things we had in place from Esther 3. We would like to maintain a director of leadership development and onboarding. It's been a really useful role this year, but it was a one-year role. When we put it in place, we knew we wanted them to build some stuff up, send us some recommendations, and that we would not be able to maintain that role. And she's done some excellent work backing up our principles this year and building some onboarding systems that we plan to take into future years. Uh, we also would love to maintain family liaisons. We have a 1.0 this year at Gibbs. We want to take another look at liaison work because we don't know that it's sustainable for us to have one at every school. And so we want to look at whether there's a different model that we can use for liaisoning, whether we can make some staff that we already have, maybe a partial liaison and, and a partial something else. And so we're going to take a look at the model on that um, and make some decisions about how best to do that. And we're going to only have a 0.6 communication specialist next year instead of a full time. Yeah. So are we still staffing a welcome center or? Yes, we are still staffing a welcome center. Um, and I can speak a little more about what staff are there, but that 0.6 communication specialist, we have two registrar um, type roles, they're family engagement specialists, um, an administrative assistant is shared with DEI. So yes, still there. Uh, we also have some commitments that were made in previous budget years using a combination of COVID dollars um, COVID grant dollars and operating budget funds. And I want to name them now because we're keeping them and they were very strategically placed when we knew we were having increasing secondary enrollments. Um, so it's notable that they are there in this moment of increasing secondary, but decreasing elementary. We added 6.2 positions at Arlington high in FY 24. Um, a number of those were tied to the opening of the building and various spaces within the building. And a number of them were tied to programming. Uh, at the high school, some of it linked to the new building. We added 3.9 positions at OMS and Gibbs in last year's budget and in previous years had added uh, learning communities at Audison Middle School. The students are grouped into learning communities at Audison and Gibbs. And we had um, increased the number of learning communities, which basically increases the number of core teachers to reduce class sizes at those schools. Uh, we're maintaining additional staff and sections that we had added in Gibbs and FY23. They have the biggest class they're going to have next school year. And we maintained, due to a big increase in students two years ago, the staffing level at that time, and we're carrying it through um, into FY25. We shifted last year. Um, the monotony paraprofessionals work in a setting where they are primarily working with students with significant needs. And so they moved from being TAs, which is a lower paid paraprofessional, to being SSPs, which is a higher paid paraprofessional. We actually now have everybody on a similar grid after our agreement in December, but we had shifted them to be higher paid paraprofessionals in FY24 and have maintained that commitment. Um, and our elementary class sizes are being maintained at between 20 and 25 students per section for next year even given the reductions that we're having in elementary sections. So we're trying to maintain service level even as we have a couple of reductions at the elementary level. So I'll talk specifically about what we are adding and subtracting. Um, in FY25, we're looking at a reduction of five classroom teachers. Um, this is actually six from FY24, but we had one that we added in FY24 that then we're taking out in FY25, so it's not reflected here because from 24 budget to 25 budget, it's net zero. Um, but we also have five additional teachers that have been in previous budgets that will be eliminated next school year because those students are moving up into the secondary level. Um, we are aligned with reduction in sections. You can take a look at reduction in specialists. So we're reducing PE specialists at the elementary level by 1.0. Um, we had last year two curriculum specialists in social studies and one in science. We were trying out that model to give some additional support to social studies. We decided that we really only need one curriculum specialist in social studies and science, and we're going to maintain that level for next year. So we're reducing one curriculum specialist. We're reducing an instructional coach at the middle school level. Um, we'd like to get a, a stronger model for instructional coaching at the middle level in place before we um, invest in staffing in that sort of program. And we're uh, reducing a library paraprofessional at the elementary level that had been 
um, added to sort of make schedules work last year, but that we feel like we can do without next school year. We also have some corrections. I'm including these for the sake of transparency, um, but for the most part, this is us making sure that our data um, accurately reflect the number of positions we're actually holding and carrying through in the budget. So um, there are a couple of things in here that are just adjustments from based on how we've say filled a position. So for example, if we have uh, somebody in a teaching assistant position at, at Pierce and they're filling that position at 0.66, then and we don't feel the need to carry it at 1.0, then we're reducing that 0.33 because that person intends to stay and it's fine if it's part-time. So we have a number of positions that we're just maintaining at the level of staffing that they're currently at and we're not going to plan on filling it to a full 1.0 or positions like this classroom teacher at Bracket that has been carried for a number of years but is not actually filled. And so we're cleaning out the data to make sure that it accurately reflects um, what's vacant, what's not, and what we actually plan on filling for next school year. So these are just corrections. Um, the FY25 budget additions are listed here, and I want to be really clear about what these additions are. Most of these, everything with a double star next to it, which is everything except this classroom teacher position at Monotony and this specialized support paraprofessional 2.0 positions, um, 0.6 of which is actually already at Monotony. So it's actually only a 1.4 from what we have right now addition. All of these other positions are currently in the system. These are positions that based on student needs we added after the FY24 budget closed. So this is maintenance of service. Um, and that is because when we started the FY24 year, we had a number of programs, we had a lot of new leaders. We had a number of programs that required additional staffing. So like if you look at the high school, uh, we've had additional custodial needs as a result of the new high school opening. We've had a tutor added to a learning center to provide more early support for students who needed additional homework help or who needed additional support in a particular content area. So we created a 0.6 tutor on top of a 0.4 that had already been there. Um, we've needed one-to-one uh, -one classroom aids. So there's a number of one-to-one -one roles that I'm not finding quick here. They are one-to-one -one teaching assistant 5.0. These are supports required as a part of an IEP. So it gets written into a student's IEP that they require a one-to-one -one aid. We are regulatorily required to provide that level of service. Um, when we took a look at our SLC at Stratton, um, the way that that was being staffed compared to what our students needed told us that we needed to add more support there. So there's all of these roles for the most part are in response, direct response to student needs. This accounts actually for a lot of what you see as an increase in spending for special education in FY25. Um, and then there, because Monotomy just opened and has an additional classroom, we want to make sure that we put a teacher in that classroom and have more space for more students to enter Monotomy. So most of these additions, with the exception of the one that Monotomy, are positions that already exist within the system. They are not new humans in FY25. And here are some of our brilliant students, and I'm happy to take any questions given that. Uh, before we do so, Percy or Len or Jane or Paul, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I want to say thank um, Dean and Josh and Peggy for their patience this year um, with, with Michael's uh, sudden absence due to the early birth of his child. Um, we had a few hiccups. We had a condensed schedule. We had more versions of the budget come out than we normally do with corrections. So it was a bit of a, a bumpy year, but they uh, went on long for the ride for us. So we're very grateful for that. Um, Mr. Cardin has, Len has uh, led us through a number of budget subcommittee meetings to do all of that work. And we appreciate that. The only other thing to add is uh, to clarify why we are, when we're reducing the sections, uh, classroom sections this coming year, it's not changing the number of students in the class. It's because the group that's coming from the lower grade to the upper grade is smaller than the one that's already there. So, because a lot of times when parents hear that we're reducing sections, they assume that it's going to affect class size in the end. That is not true. Thank you all for Thank you all for mm -hmm. uh, Dean, Josh, um, hey, John, here, do you want to say anything before we open it up for questions? Uh, no, just thanks for 
pulling it together in time for our <coughs> deadline as well. Yes, I appreciate it. All stressful. Mm -hmm. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> all right, questions. Has questions. Charlie. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, Dr. Holland, the uh, if the secondary in this chart where the secondary enrollment and the uh, elementary enrollment cross, mm -hmm. um, and the secondary, I'm sorry, the elementary enrollment is dropping, doesn't that say that the future population, school population, is going to drop? So, yes. I mean, what we're at right now, I would say, is the evening out. And so it, it remains to be seen whether that line that stabilizes, as some of the projections show it stabilizing, some of the projections show it dropping, um, none of them that we've seen show it significantly increasing, which tracks with <clears throat> what we've seen in the pandemic, which is a decrease in birth rates. Um, Arlington is a densely populated town of a lot of people who move in and out. And one of the hardest things about our projections has been accounting for moves um, and vacancy rates in rental properties, um, in you know what, what real estate sales are gonna do, whether new families are gonna move in. So all of our projections, part of why we use the five-year um, weighted average is because our past is the best predictor, is, has been the best predictor of our present and future. So I would say what this is demonstrating is the leveling out that graph and that the other projection graph is also showing a leveling out and that our numbers are showing a leveling out. Whether that stays level, assuming Arlington stays about as populated as it is with young kids, or whether that drops some more, will kind of remain to be seen. We'll keep using that five-year weighted average. We're down a little bit this year and anticipate being so in elementary as well. You're right that as those big classes of students move out, that we should see a drop in enrollment if everything stays stable where it's at right now. So over the next five to six years, if, if our kindergarten rates stay the same, then slowly the school district will see a decrease in enrollment. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so we know that not every kid costs the district the same amount. You know, we know some subgroups of special education um, just are more expensive. Um, my memory is that that is also true at the secondary level, so that there are additional resources you need at the secondary level. So as we have a district that's moving into more heavily weighted to secondary students, that that comes with a cost. Is that is that right? Is that? I would say yes. Often what can happen is that um, Force if if we we're, we're not doing a if we're not doing the job we hope to do when it comes to address needs at a really early age, mm -hmm. then the challenges that students face if that gap is growing will only increase as they head into secondary school. So we have more students, for example, on IEPs at secondary level than we do at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. um, that. And if you have that and you need to provide more services for a student who is struggling with math class, that there are constraints in the secondary schedule mm -hmm. that make it difficult to do that without adding staff. So, you know, we you can run, there are ways to run a secondary schedule efficiently so that you can provide those services as flexibly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of no matter what level you're at, if you have a student with significant needs, they're going to require additional resources. Sometimes that's going to include additional staffing as we're seeing in this year's budget. Um, and often there are only more students with those needs at the secondary level than at the elementary level. I was actually also referring to my memory is so you have a certain number of students and you say the elementary level, <laughs> you, you know, class of 25, you know that not just one teacher supports that class because you have a gym teacher and a music teacher and so mm -hmm. forth. And my memory is that the, the numbers that you need to support say 25 students at the secondary level is a higher number yeah. than you would for the other. So it's like, I can't remember the numbers, but 1.3 versus 1.5 or something. Yes, mostly because the programming options at the secondary level, particularly at the high school, are so much more. So you want to provide them with as many options as possible. We have a program of studies that is incredible at the high yeah. school, um, and you have to account for what they're going to opt into. Now, the nice thing about that is you can also base staffing decisions on 
what students opt into if you can run schedules early enough. So we're trying to move that earlier because it helps us make projections about what kind of staffing levels we need. But we can also be flexible with the high school principal and let them um, within the bottom line of FTEs move what he needs based on how the schedule is built. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just have a few questions on the large book you sent us. <laughs> um, on page 18, you talk about the special ed category doesn't include expenditures for preventative efforts through intervention. So this is response to intervention. The but in the budget transfer category for special education on page 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk about, I'm sorry, page 19. The start, the actress. Okay. Correct. So, um, so this is classrooms. This is kids are still in the right. regular classroom and they're getting extra help. Um, yes. So, so that asterisk is accounting for the fact that um, we may have students who receive targeted intervention. That do not have an IEP, or even who receive targeted intervention that's not linked to their IEP. Um, sorry, I just had my screen get sort of partially taken over by. The, oh, sorry. The Zoom. If you, if you, oh, <laughs> I got sorry. distracted by that. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yes. So, that's not accounting for all of the different things we might do to intervene with a student who's being challenged by content um, within the budget. That doesn't count. For Reading interventionists, it doesn't count for math interventionists, um, the special education line. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then inclusion specialist, that's special ed related, correct? The, the inclusion specialist position. Yeah. So that was a new position that we created to help with um, really lack of space and class sizes at the Thompson. Um, we're also working on what we might need to do to adjust enrollment booms at the Thompson um, with, you know, things like buffer zones and other mechanisms that we have available to us. That role specifically was designed um, to provide support to teachers in giving inclusive services to students. Not We wanted them to have a dual certification in special education so that they could provide services if they were, say, in a classroom um, that had a lot of students and there were students with needs who they could service. But it's also a dual certified role. So we wanted them to have the general education background as well. Um, and we were trying not to always default to hiring non-licensed staff to support large class sizes. We wanted to support teachers in supporting large class sizes as well as support the kids. And so we created this position um, as a trial this year to see how it would do in supporting Thompson with an additional certified teacher. Um, so unit D is settled. Is that right? Correct. Um, right. For this year, we go back to the bargaining table and with them the next, next year for all the other bargaining language. We only talked to them about compensation in this last round. Okay. We did it's, get an additional. For this year and next year. So we negotiate for them for the following year. We did, as a part of that negotiation, get additional time from Unity. So we have like an additional 100 minutes per week that we get to allocate towards breakfast programming, um, various other programming, tutoring for students. Um, and so that actually is significantly helping us and saving us some money as well, but that was- well, that's that significant. Well. Mm -hmm. if, 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 um, and then just a curiosity question, how many Afghan students were there last time? We had, I'd have to go look up a number. We've had an increase. Um, I am not, and we actually got a grant to help support our families who have come from Afghanistan, but I don't know the exact number unless anybody else does it. No. <laughs> I could get it though. <laughs> you get it. Okay, thank you. Mike. Superintendent, the budget's a masterpiece of, of pulling together parts and pieces and resources and things like that. And, and, and you're well commended on that. How are you doing as a school? How's the teaching? How's the learning? How do you measure your own success? I hope you can speak to that with a little bit more specificity than you know, Lake Wobegon School District, where everybody is strong, handsome, and above average. That's a great question, but I would need a whole bunch of other slides that I didn't write <laughs> to help answer it. All right, um, I'll, I'll narrow it. Yep, that'd be helpful. How do you measure how well you do mm -hmm. as a teaching institution? 
So we have a number of different things that we rely on as our measures of success. Um, in the strategic plan, we name specific ones for each individual initiative um, that would take me too long to outline here. There are a few things that, you know, if, if pressed and asked in setting like this, I would say we pay very close attention to our accountability ratings. Um, and that is because the state has recently revised how they think about accountability and they grade us, they give us points basically based on how well we do improving absenteeism of students, improving outcomes for like test and academic outcomes, as well as absenteeism outcomes, as well as high school graduation rates for the very focal groups that I named and that we put in our strategic plan. So the state actually rates us against like how well have your English learners learned English? How well have um, students that are from low income families done in your school this year? And we have to submit plans to the state um, linked to the Student Opportunity Act, which is linked to the funding formula that funds Chapter 70 that says what we're doing in those areas. And so we use the accountability measures that come from the state in a big way to assess how we're doing. Our accountability ratings this year, this school year, from last year's MCAS scores and all of the other data we submit to the state were as good as they get. We were meeting our exceeding standards across the board. Um, and so that was a really great thing to see. And that tells us that we're doing well academically, not only for all of our kids, but also for those students who might have been underserved by the system previously. Um, in addition to that, we survey our families, students, and staff routinely. Um, we use the results from that survey. I'm actually doing a forum with families later this week where I report back what the results were, how we're thinking about them, what we feel like we're doing well on. We've said over the last couple of years, we want to focus on improving belonging for all of our kids, and we want to focus on improving this sense that I'm held to a high standard rigor for all of our kids. And what we've heard from them is that we are steadily improving those things. Um, we have survey results that say that while we are not knocking it out of the ballpark on rigorous expectations and belonging, we are steadily improving those two things for our students at the elementary and secondary levels. Um, we have areas to improve around communications, um, around how we address challenging topics of culture and identity in our schools. But uh, overall, those are the things we look to first to say we're getting it right or we've still got some room to go. Thank you. Um, is there any long-term um, evaluation of student successes five, 10 years out from graduation? Um, yes, the state takes data on four-year graduation rates from college, on uh, college matriculation, and we that's some of that um, college and four-year graduation rate for the high school, as well as uh, uh, engagement in advanced coursework, which was one of the areas we saw a lot of improvement this past year, um, get are part of that accountability rating that I was talking about. Um, post-college isn't factored into those data, but it is some of the data that we have and can look at. So down the road, I think, after we've had a chance to graduate and matriculate and go through college, some of the kids who we're doing some of this work on, we're going to keep a very close eye on. I think, I think the federal standard is how many kids who enroll in college end up getting their degree after, what, is it six years? Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Annie? Well, I, Michael just covered it, but you're talking about the national data that's standardized across the board that all institutions get. I have a lot of clients who get it, and that goes up to six years of data. Mm -hmm. The student is out of college for a semester and comes back. They'll help on a big barrier again. It doesn't just end at four years. Mm -hmm. John and Angela. Um, first, thank you for um, all the efforts that went into this budget. You can tell <clears throat> that you guys worked really hard on it, and uh, just looking it over very easy to see what changed from last year, you know, uh, at least my takeaway from what changed from last year is it, it seems like uh, the, uh, the, the FTEs kind of like came close to stabilizing. In other words, you know, not a lot of new hiring last year, but at the same time, uh, compensate the people that do work here a little bit more um, generously. That's kind of the big picture of what happened in the last year, or at least going forward, that's what the plan is going forward. Um, so, uh, I actually have three quick three questions. I'll try to keep them as quick as possible. But the first one is, um, as far as the salary, you know, uh, this one bullet here says allocations to support competitive compensation in preparation for bargaining with the unit A negotiations. Mm -hmm. So, I 
Can you just kind of explain the rationale there? Like, for instance, first of all, Unit A, are they the teachers? Yes. They're the teachers. So are they under contract through FY25? No. They're not. No, they start a new contract in FY25. So, so we're bargaining with them right now. This year, they're out of contract? Yes. So, you know, come September 1st, the, yeah, I guess, so that's where the reserves come from. And mm -hmm. that's where um, the... The pay. So the so um, I'm just wondering, like, how it call when they sit down and negotiate, you know, whatever they you know negotiate for, it's four percent, five percent, twelve percent over how many, over many years. <laughs> that's going to be applied to the FY25 salary. The, excuse me, the FY24 salary. Uh, 25. 25. Yeah, 25. Yeah. So I guess what I'm getting to is what's like. So you raise the salary before negotiations, then they apply the colas. Are we going to get hit with? Much, so like a much higher base. We we negotiated new salaries for Unit D in FY twenty four this yeah. year. We are currently in negotiations with Unit A for the start of their next contract, which will be FY twenty five. Yeah. So that so different different groups. Yeah. yeah. Um. So what we committed in the override. Do you, you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, so the amount you see in the budget. We committed is the amount that we committed to the public. We would put towards salary along with the three hundred thousand that we were putting towards unit D. Yeah, so yeah. the two million, two million, two million dollars was promised. But that was, it was already public. The yeah. Union knows that. They know that that two million dollars is there to grab, right? Yeah. So uh, as far as the strategy, um, it's going to be similar to what the police union did. It's going to be a market adjustment. Um, hopefully, we're in negotiations. We don't know. But the idea is a market adjustment and a COLA. Yeah. And so the COLA is already there in the budget. Um, we're not going to say what it is, but there is a COLA built into the budget. And then there's this pot for market adjustment. Then they end up going into a COLA and they end up going into certain steps and lanes. It may end up going into different places um, that we're currently negotiating with them. Yeah, so that makes perfect sense. So essentially, we're going, we're trying to budget for a contract that isn't completed, but right. it will exactly. hit in FY25. Yeah. So, right. okay, that, that really clarifies a lot of stuff. Um, now, the next question is the state funding, you know, speaking kind of stabilized this year. In other words, it didn't go up as much as it has gone mm -hmm. in prior years. Um, so, were there any considerations? And, you know, all right, the state of Massachusetts has decided we just can't spend as much on education this year. Were there any, um, adjustments made on your end? In other words, you know, we just, certain things have to be cut because that's what's getting handed down. Yeah, one of the biggest impacts of some of the um, really a, a little bit surprising uh, either stabilizations or even decreases in some of our title funding, which is some of the state-based allocation funding, has been to Title I, which is sig most significantly impacts our um, students from low-income households. Yeah. And we use so during the pandemic, Title I funding significantly expanded. We had the COVID funds as well. So we were able to put a lot of dollars towards expanding our Title I summer programming in particular. And we have had to now constrain our Title I programming to only serve um, a sort of smaller subset of those students who benefit most directly from having the services that come from that funding. But what we've been able to do because we uh, negotiated with Unit D, like I said, for an additional 100 minutes a week, is try to shift some of the things that we were using those dollars for towards being uh, built into the school's budget. So trying to do a little bit more, like let's say you have students who don't necessarily come from a low-income household, but could use some extra tutoring, because those two things are not necessarily linked, yeah. then we can have some tutoring before school, or we can do a little bit of before school homework help programming uh, because it's built into the contract that we have those people for that amount of time. And so that that in bargaining, we're trying to be really strategic about making up the difference of some of the spaces where we might be losing some state allocation grants. Um, so it is having, but it is having an impact. I mean, we simply serve fewer students in the summer now than we were able to at the height of the pandemic when we had all these additional funds. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Now, um, so kind of continuing along that, you know, that's, great kind of color and detail, which I would never really do, you know, be able to see from the budget, but it's, it's great background. What I do see in the budget is are the numbers. And it's basically, um, you know, the, 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 the top line numbers. In other words, um, the, what Arlington taxpayers are paying, what the state is paying, 
and uh, you know what the overall budget is increasing. And as you know, we all know the the, the school budget is going up by eight percent. The state input is kind of like almost uh, like level funded. So then the taxpayers contribution is actually going up by ten percent. So which I think it comes up to right around seven million dollars, which was the full override that was just passed. So you know. As far as you know, getting feedback from the students and everything, put me down as you know, we love the Arlington schools, they're excellent, you know, couldn't be happier with them. But I do worry, is this sustainable? Like, in other words, if if this budget passes and, and is implemented, are we essentially voting for an override in, in a year or two years? Like, how, how is this gonna like, is there any long term projection? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know, that's more of a political discussion than an administrative position. Yeah. Um, so we had the plan that went to the voters, yeah. and the plan only covered three fiscal years, right? FY24, FY25, and FY26. The plan showed a cliff in FY27. That's what we put before the voters, and, they, and, and, it, and it passed, right? So we still have that cliff. It's yeah. a tiny bit larger because of this Chapter 70 state funding issue. Um, but when the when the town reconciles all their revenue with the new growth coming in higher than expected and other revenue coming in higher than expected, that cliff will narrow again. So when when we when the long range planning committee that you have representatives on meets again in the spring, that's the right forum to discuss that going forward. For FY26, though, this is the plan that we put before the voters, and this is what we're delivering to the to to the town. Okay. So if, if we're I, very aware, you know, we're, we're very aware that there's that clip out there. We're being very careful in adding positions. We're only adding two, you know, these three new people from Anatomy next year. That that's it, really. We're funding. We're we're bringing in in other positions that were funded by the Esther grant, and we added those positions during FY24, and that's that's where the spending is is increasing. But we're careful. We're going to be very careful about adding positions over the next few years. Because of what you're what you're talking about, yeah. But in the meantime, okay. we're we're continuing to spend the levels that we've committed to the voters. So just to summarize, it sounds like we all know we're heading towards. So in short, it does not sound. You know, without an override, it does not sound uh, yeah, but That's something, something for the long range planning. Something can back, to, unless something changes. So, yep. I guess the final question, well, you know, which is in the future, we'd have to consider a plan B, like you know, plan exactly. A override, plan B. I don't know, and maybe that's this is the right form for that, but at some no. point. Oh, did you want to add Yeah, I just wanted to add one sure. thing. The yeah. only budget that's out there on the state side right now is the governor's budget, which is pretty meager. Um, there's a lot of pressure being put on legislators right now to improve the chapter 70 numbers and the other numbers, uh, underlying numbers within the budget. Yeah. And traditionally, the, the Senate and House coming with a higher number than the governor's budget anyway. So, uh, because of the lobbying, because there, there, there's a lot of activity and a lot of districts are getting hurt by this much worse than we are. The, the, so there's a lot of noise out there in the yeah. Commonwealth and a lot of pressure on the state reps. It is an election year, so I, I'd expect that. So chapter might, seven might go up, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, three, three questions. So one is, <clears throat> Lynn just touched on this idea that we're just hiring so putting on three new bodies this year. But, you know, the, the, the COVID funds, the extra money was supposed to be one time money. So we really are not, we're really adding more than three people because the funding for the extra people has gone away. So that represents a significant increase in staffing that's not part of the historic continuum. Um, <clears throat> so I have a, a question, uh, Dr. Holman. Um, you mentioned earlier that in the, I think it's the unit D personnel, they went from one grade level to an SSB, is that the mm -hmm. term of art you used? Mm -hmm. So, and that's higher payload. Mm -hmm. Was there a skill change there? In other words, um, but did we just sort of magically anoint them as higher level people, or do we bring in new people, or did we train them? What? How did we get the, the justification for paying them at this new professional yeah. grade level? That's a great question. So they um, had, be, be, the nature of monotomy programming is that 
we had assigned them assigned as teaching assistants to the classrooms um, when we had a few specialized support personnel. But if you look at the job descriptions between an SSP and a TA, there were a lot of pieces of the SSP job descriptions that TAs at Monotomy were expected to do um, because of the kind of environment that they were in where um, half of the students in a classroom had significant special needs and where at Monotomy, we have the most full inclusion model for students with IEPs that we have anywhere else in the district. Um, and so during the pandemic, we had done additional training also with the SSP, with the now SSPs, then TAs at Monotomy. And when you compared their skill set, their training, and the demands of the job against our SSPs elsewhere in the district, they, they were doing the job of an SSP. Um, and we had gone through the work of doing the additional training with them. And so we had a lengthy discussion with them about this um, and ended up doing an MOA with them to come to agreement about what the appropriate level of salary would be, knowing that it was our goal to get everyone in Unit D paid at a competitive level and knowing that we did not pay our other TAs in the district at a competitive level. But they were, if you look at the salary study um, a couple of years ago, the most underpaid um, people in our district were our teaching assistants. And so knowing that strategically we really wanted to move everybody up to the level of pay that our SSPs were at at the time, um, and that there really was no good argument for keeping them at the TA level given their training, given the environment that they were teaching in and the demands of the job, we made an agreement with them to move them up to that pay level um, and then to do the work of negotiating with Unit D, which we've now done. And as a result of that, everybody, all of the SSPs at Monotomy now provide that extra 100 minutes a week that we agreed to in the Unit D um, agreement. So they, they received that earlier pay earlier because of the training they received over the course of the pandemic. So, so it was a true grade change as opposed to a salary mm -hmm. bump. Yeah, it was a yeah, it was a change in the job description. So I have one more question, which uh, Michael Rubin sort of asked it in general, but I've got a very specific question. So over the last several years, we heard a great deal about the achievement gap and closing the achievement gap. Are we closing the achievement gap? Fair question. So we are closing the achievement gap for some groups in some grade levels and less so in others for others. So we're doing well in science at beginning to close the achievement gap, particularly for English learners. Um, we are, I'd have to pull all this data up to see it. Um, we are leveling out the gap in elementary ELA and we've just implemented a new literacy curriculum um, that we're hoping will begin to turn that achievement gap to be much smaller. Um, I am happy to give you a lot of data on this, Mr. Foskett, but I don't have it sitting right in front of me. Could you send it, please? Uh, yeah, sure. It's also on our district profile on the DESE website, and you can look at like different subgroups and what they achieve versus all students. Um, but we have this out in graphs, and I can show you I what a close graphs. Graph like. I just yeah. I'm surprised I didn't see it tonight. I can send you the outcomes report that we sent to the full community also that talked a little bit about this too. Dean and then I'll I want to ask you a few questions. Um, they're consistent with what I asked the town manager. I just want to phrase them a little differently. Um, and I'll say some of them if you don't want to fully answer them. I'm okay. Just the preference, okay? Um, so the first one is current and future relationships with our work. Right, so here's my here's my preface. Okay, um, when I was a kid, teacher strikes were unicorn events. Like in 1995, I was a senior at Belmont High, and the teachers were on strike, and they're the first teachers on strike for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. And 12 years later, teachers union went on strike. 12 years later, Dedham went on strike. That was in 19, and these were like big events. Okay, the last two years, following schools have gone on strike: Brookline, Alden, Averill, Woburn. Andover and Newton, well gone longer. Okay, mm -hmm. that doesn't count for Melrose, Medford, and a host of others that were teed up, ready to go. Okay, so 
it clearly indicates that there's a problem, right? Like, and I, I'm going to be a little bit personalized. This, like, my wife was teed up in that Melrose strike, and I watched how hard it was for her. So this isn't like willy nilly, like greedy, selfish teachers who are like, we're going for that. But like, there, this is a problem. 24, 12 months from today, hmm? the Arlington teacher is going to be in front of Arlington High? Absolutely not. I can say that with a lot yeah. of confidence. Okay. Um, I And I live in Newton. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I remember. I wouldn't say that if I didn't outline. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Both, both Dr. Homan and her predecessor have done a lot of work in building good relationships. Mm -hmm with the union and that matters a lot. Mm -hmm. There are deep concerns you know, across the state about pay. Fortunately, we have the override money that we've been talking about that'll help address that. It's very timely that we have that, but also the, the baseline is there, right? There's, a, there's, there's a, a level of trust that is not present in a lot of other districts um, that we fortunately have in Arlington. And I'll add to that by saying, you know, Arlington has demonstrated just in this year such a commitment to competitive pay for its educators. And that, and, and then we have followed up on that commitment by setting those dollars aside in the FY25 budget and saying we're going to make good on that promise. That following, that kind of follow through builds on that trust, that foundation of trust, and is the only reason I can confidently respond to that question. Um, so. But the other thing is all the teachers saw all of the school committee out there working for the override specifically to increase teacher pay. I mean, we were saying that. And I think that builds a lot of respect because we're putting our time, we're putting our energy and we're working, we can, we're clearly working for them in a very public way. Arlington is just a community that keeps its promises, right? We right. said we're going to do something, we're going to do it. It started you know, years ago, and it went from long range planning all the way through this committee, through the school committee, and we just, we do what we say we're going to do. And it's just really important that we keep doing that. Okay, second question. Um, what keeps you up at like what bothers you? Like it doesn't show it doesn't show up on this presentation. It's not in the budget, but it just it's a problem. It bothers you. You know the answer. <laughs> I do. It's the answer to Mr. Foskett's question. If we like and and it's that that takes so much time. Closing achievement gaps for kids, making a school system operate effectively and create a sense of belonging for every single kid and allow every single child to thrive and be curious and do all the stuff of learning in our schools. Creating a system that actually does that takes so much time and it takes so much trust building. It takes so much um, blood, sweat and tears on the part of educators that if it, it's yeah. hard to, we're in year one of a strategic plan where we said we were gonna close achievement gaps. You don't eliminate an achievement gap in year one of a strategic plan. And to know that we are continuing in a system that does systematically underserve some of our kids because they demonstrate a need and we miss it because we're trying to do a zillion things or we don't have the support available right at the right moment or the student feels ostracized because of an interaction with a peer. Like for all of the different reasons that we sometimes fall short. That's what keeps me up. Anything else, Dean? I'll toss you. Well, good pay is great. Results are better. About 10 days ago, the Boston Globe in their main editorial stated that if you want your kids to learn reading, you should send them to Mississippi. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Are Arlington's, all of our Arlington's elementary schools using the best reading programs available based on science and are our kids learning to read? I'm really excited to answer that question. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so we will be in FY25. Right now in FY25, all of our students 
will have access to a curriculum that is backed by the science of reading research. Um, they will, they all already get access to rigorous phonics instruction. They all already are, are screened routinely from kindergarten through grade three, and if needed through grades four, five, and six for any uh, gaps that they might have in their foundational literacy development. Um, and this year we began a pilot. 25% of our elementary sections are working with the new curriculum. And this curriculum is based in science of reading research that says that if you build kids um, schema in a particular content area, and then you build their vocabulary and content knowledge in that area, they will learn to read faster. They will learn to read uh, with more depth and understanding. Their comprehension will improve. And that is how this curriculum is built and organized. And like I said, 25% of our classrooms are using it this year, 100% of our classrooms. Are using it next year. So do all our elementary schools use the same reading curriculum? Uh, next fall, yes. Okay. As soon as so, we get everybody else on the same curriculum. So we don't have to send our kids to Mississippi. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of the opposite of Dean's question about what keeps you up at night. Okay, which is this. We all know that at some point throwing money at a problem ceases to be effective. Okay, and yet um, there's a, it's, it's hard to gauge or judge when you're at that moment. Okay, so when you say that you have this thing keeping up at night about reaching all of these kids, is that a time and attention and a technique problem? How much of that is a money problem? And I know we just gave you yeah. a bunch of money to help with that, but I'm mm -hmm. just saying. It's, it, I mean, both, right? Which is a probably unsatisfactory answer, so I'll try no, to be more specific. specific. Satisfactory answer. No satisfactory answer was, oh no, we need $10 million more. <laughs> so. that, yeah, don't, not that. I mean, okay. it's definitely part of why we have a strategic plan. And it's like, we're going to put our dollars in these buckets um, is because we think that that will make a difference. I mean, one of the, I think one of the questions that was asked here last year was if you had to prioritize any of these things, which one would you prioritize? And I said compensation because the quality of the educator you put in front of a child really matters and you're not going to attract the highest quality folks if you can't offer a competitive salary now you're also not going to attract them if you if they don't you know feel like they connect with that community and its purpose and its goals so you need both but at the at, like if you have that purpose and that connection and you're offering five percent less than the neighbor down the street you're definitely not going to attract the best educator to be in front of the students. And the number one factor that people tell you impacts a student's achievement is the quality of the educator in front of them. So you definitely need both. Um, and you have to be able to really identify and pinpoint, and this is some of the work we've been trying to do in professional development, like what is the strategy that will make the biggest difference for the most kids that we can teach as many educators as possible, as quickly as possible, with as few resources as possible, so that we can get the biggest bang for our buck um, with the dollars that we do have. I mean, if you compare Arlington to other districts of the same size in our immediate area, you'll see $130 million budgets. And that has a big impact on the ability to pull in consultants for professional development. We try to do as much of that in house as we can. So we try to find our experts and put them in front of educators and have them provide the professional development as often as we can, because that saves us dollars. Um, but sometimes you have to pull in the expensive consultants in order to teach the methods for the new curriculum that you're just now rolling out. We're doing that now. Um, and so, you know, it's always both and. Um, we will always operate within a constrained environment in Arlington. And so, we have to be really thoughtful about what we need to spend money on the $30,000 consultant for and what we just absolutely don't. Right. And every other decision is similarly made. Right. Where do we actually, where's the target going to actually assist? So let me ask you a flip side question then. So we know who the kids are who are struggling. We know where the gaps are because of all the things that we are measuring. There's kids at the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. who are not the fits perfect kid either. Okay. Having had one of them, I always worry that 
we're just going, oh, they'll be fine, mm -hmm. right? Because they're super smart and they're this and they're that. But that doesn't mean they're not struggling in a different way. Do we have our eyes on that problem? There's no such thing as a fits perfect kid. Um, I don't think. Having had one. Yep. <laughs> well, I don't. She felt she fit perfect. <laughs> right. But there's not, like mm -hmm. every child in front of you, and this is something we're kind of, yeah. we're working on talking about as a system. Every child in front of you has needs of some kind that are unique to that human being in front of you. Right. So if you don't create a classroom environment in your second grade class where every student, they may get some grade level content. Mm -hmm. but has an opportunity to make it their own mm -hmm. in their own way. So that could be extension. That could be, here's my avenue into this so that I can hit grade level standard or comprehension. Um, then you're, you're not doing it right. I mean, one of the things I like about this curriculum that we're rolling out right now is that at the end of every module, it has a performance test. Mm -hmm. And the kids get a lot of choice and ability to kind of create a way to doing that forms task at fifth grade, they do monologues about human rights. Um, and they can, there are all kinds of different ways you can do it. You can do it in multiple modes of media. You can, um, perf you can choose what character you're going to do your monologue from the voice of, and it can be based on how you connect with them. And so with that sort of constrained choice, you can create extension opportunities for students who are ready for it. You can uh, give students some creative options about how they convey their ideas you can provide, you can put support mechanisms in there that help kids who might struggle with it still access the task itself. And that kind of flexibility is what you have to build into every day. Now, doing that requires resources because you have to have enough support people around to help this kid fly and, and this kid get to grade level. Um, but that's, that's the dream, like, is that you can not be teaching to a middle. That's not ever the goal. You don't close an achievement gap by watching this line go down and this one go up, right? So if you've got an achievement gap and you have these kids are tracking right along and these kids are going down, that's definitely bad news because this gap is bigger. But you close an achievement gap when all groups go up, but they meet, mm -hmm. right? I'm accelerating this group that hasn't achieved at the level that we want. And this group is still improving too and they meet up here. And if you, that's what it looks like when it's closing the achievement gap. This is not closing an achievement gap. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. I like everybody else, I want to you know, thank all of you for your hard work on this. It, it, every year it gets better and better and more readable and more transparent. I wanted to bounce off something Charlie mentioned about the COVID funding. I think, you know, last few years, uh, I think it was like four and a half million dollars worth of funds to mitigate the impact of COVID. And I know we HVAC and remote learning and things like that. And it looks like it's dropping to zero um, from eight hundred eighty thousand dollars. I'm wondering what what specific positions or functions uh, are we losing? Uh, and I'm sorry, I haven't read the, all two hundred fifty four pages yet. Mm -hmm. it, it may be in the document, but I was wondering what, yeah, what positions are gone, what functions are gone because this money's going away. So we've been really careful about making sure that as we went along, that we wrapped whatever we wanted to keep from those dollars into the plan to keep it sustainable. Um, because yes, those are one-time dollars and we knew they were going away. And this year with that 880,000 left, we needed to make sure that we spent it down. Like you don't wanna leave money on the table. Um, and we knew that there was no way we were pulling all 880,000 of that over into the base budget. That wasn't going to happen. Um, so we, we tried to select roles that we thought would have the biggest impact for a short period of time. So the leadership development and onboarding role was in response to some specific requests from unit D in negotiations um, previously, as well as the fact that we knew we were going to have four new principals this year um, that we're all going to need oriented to being a new principal. And that's a lot of new principals to onboard all at once. Um, we knew we needed, um, one of the things we've seen in some of our data is that we have a lot of teachers in their first five years with us who on surveys will say that they feel the least connected to their colleagues, the least connected to the school culture, um, the, 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 the least sort of sense of efficacy in their work. And 
that's really concerning. Like that tells us we're not onboarding new teachers very well. And these are the folks we're going to lose in years five, six, after we've invested in them, off they go, right? And that's not ideal. So that leadership development and onboarding uh, role we put in place for this year, knowing full well we weren't going to have it next year. And we said, write us onboarding programming, work with our mentors, find us a partnership with an organization that can provide mentorship um, training to our mentors for new principals, which they're doing this year. Uh, so we, she's gotten some mechanisms off the ground that we can continue into future years, but we won't have that role next year. Um, we really want to expand the capacity of our individual schools to work in partnership with families. There are other districts where this looks like a full-time position, districts where there are a lot more Title I funds, there are a lot more just allocation grants from the state. Those things are resulted from COVID and pandemic. Um, well, in some of these districts that have roles like family liaisons, the just the allocation grants and the competitive grant access is a lot higher because of the populations in those towns. Arlington isn't competitive for a lot of grants from the state because of our tax base in terms of our like the um, affluence that we have in Arlington. You know, it sounds like that that would have happened without the pandemic. True. Right. So yeah. she's getting that. She so we added a family liaison last year with the Esther with the COVID funding yeah. to try that out. Other towns have it. They fund it on an ongoing basis from other grants. We got this pot of money. We tried it. It's not sustainable. It's not something we're going to continue. Right. So gone. Right. Okay. So there are. So there, there's many residual income uh, uh, oblig financial obligations once this money is gone away. Well, so right. we went over that that chart. There are there are four positions, three three point six that we're moving that we are continuing. Mm -hmm. We tried them with the with the COVID funding. And we decided they're really valuable to the district. We're going to continue them. Okay. You didn't give up anything else for those? Uh, well, sort of we did because we've got these other positions that we're eliminating because of, okay. of uh, at the elementary school because of class sizes. And, uh, so it sounds like the one time money was sort of well, not, not totally one time. I mean, all Correct. of that we one used time the one time money, money was, yeah. to experiment with, with things. Some of them we're keeping because we found them valuable, their priorities. We're at, for the budget is always a prioritization, right? So we found these things are higher priority than the social studies coach. We had two social studies coaches going down to one because these these other things are higher priority than that social studies coach. So the, the budget is always a sense of laddering the priority. Sure. And we did have those extra funds that allowed us to experiment, which was wonderful. And we were able to find some things that we wanted to keep. Okay, thank you. Just as one more example of that though, like. Two years ago, we added a partial learning community at one of the elementary schools using COVID funds, which a year or two later, we rolled in to the base budget. So you all have been seeing over the last couple of years, examples of us doing exactly what Mr. Carter just talked about, which is take dollars that are in a grant that we think are high priority additions to the budget and move them over into the base so that we can sustain them. And this is what the COVID dollars set up is because the reality was the needs resulting from COVID weren't going to go away after four or five years. It was going to completely transform the school system. And then we were going to have to figure out like towns and municipalities and departments all over the town are needing to figure out what we keep from the needs that we've identified, targeted, addressed, and what we simply can't sustain because the dollars are going. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I want to come to COVID from a somewhat different angle. We sort of approached it from a financial perspective, but I don't. I don't think we've ever seen an event. And think about this: all started about four years this time, four years ago. Um, so it's a universally impactful event. How are you seeing? We're about I think about two years, or more or less, coming out of it. How are you seeing it in terms of impacts? on the kids, you know, up and down the system, and then teachers, admins, whatever. And are you seeing sort of enduring impacts coming out of it? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the biggest ones that is most visible to, to us right now is we have more adults, staff members who are have needed for various reasons to take extended leaves of absence due to their own or close family members' health 
challenges, sometimes physical health, sometimes and really very often mental health challenges of their children, of a close relative, of, um, of even a sibling. We've had you know staff members who have to be out because they're caring for a sister who has been diagnosed with cancer <clears throat> and they're the only family that they have left, for example. So like we have a lot more of those than I have ever seen in my years in education. Um, we have used up sick banks because of like horrifying illnesses that people are suffering from and they run out of time. And so the union has the bank that people donate to when they start uh, being employed. The long-term impact of that on people's mental health when they're coming to work every day is pretty significant. Um, as a result of um, some of that, we see an impact on student learning. So some of the things we're trying to prioritize as we think about next year is how to make sure that our staff have everything that they need to support them to make it to work because that has a significant impact on kids when their teacher isn't present. Um, and at the same time, teachers have a right to care for a loved one um, or, and teachers have a the, need to have the ability to stay home with a sick child. And we've had a lot more students, like initially right out of the pandemic, adolescent mental health was in severe crisis. Um, that has improved, which is great. And we've seen the increase of student participation in extracurricular activities. Um, we're really glad a couple of years ago, if you recall, we wrapped um, instrumental music into the school's budget and athletic fees into the school's budget. Since then, we've had a significant increase in student participation in both of those things. Like, yay, <laughs> likely because we're coming out of the pandemic and also likely because the fees have been eliminated, that has a positive impact on students' mental health. So, so happily, what I would have said in answer to that question a year and a half ago or two years ago is very different than the impact we're seeing now. But the impact we're seeing now is in a big way, sort of the lingering impact on a lot of the adults um, coming out of the pandemic. And that has an impact on kids because it can create inconsistency in their schedules it can create really tricky situations when you can't backfill. And I worry in a really big way about the profession itself when we cannot find special educators, we cannot find science teachers to backfill positions. Um, and you know they just don't have the big cohorts coming out of the teaching colleges anymore. I mean, the, the profession itself has been, I hate to use this word, but it feels gutted by some of the things that occurred over the past four years. Okay. And I, we do worry about that a lot. Well, we're seeing that uh, John and I do, the police are inspired by this and we're, the police department is very challenged in, in getting new police recruits. So yeah. um, having worked in government my entire career, um, it's not a great time to be in government. Mm -hmm. um, and my last question, um, I know it's very early days, but uh, well, how are you seeing the new high school this is the reverse of Dean's question. This is what <laughs> makes you smile at night. <laughs> um, that, the impact of that on adolescent mental health has probably been uh, one of the more positive things. I have a, a student advisory group that I meet with about once a month. And I talked to them maybe two weeks ago and asked them what the impact of the new school had been. They're like, oh, it's just so much light and it's just so bright. And I get to hang out with my friends and on the forum stairs or like over in the fine arts wing and the having the social spaces built into their space is awesome. Seeing them use that is amazing. Um, it's just, and it's lifted the spirits of everybody in central office too, because we're in a new office as well. So uh, we're very much enjoying the new building. It's gorgeous. Great. Yeah. Last couple of questions on the FY25 budget. So mine similar to Daryl's, except the next step, which would be, are there some um, creative things that, and you just talked about it a little bit, that um, teachers and administrators have come up with to deal with the fact that kids are coming out of COVID with so much either mental health or isolation um, and lack of socialization and lack of development in sport and music and feeling like they don't want to participate because they're not the best. You know, anything along those lines. And it's a short, really short answer. Um, I think as much um, encouragement as they can 
give students to, first of all, know what the options are. So like in our advisories at the middle school level, I'm talking about what the various clubs are encouraging kids who have an interest in this or that to check it out. Um, we've had more at the elementary level, um, extracurriculars after school, like school chorus picking up and then they'll do concerts and that's inspiring and exciting. We just had all of our townwide concerts. We've been doing that stuff for years, but um, having so much of that now in person gets kids socializing and excited about those events. So, I mean, I, I, I'm struggling to think of anything specific creative. The, some of the programming that's come out of the new building has been really exciting. Like they've opened a cafe. It's part of the courses that the kids can sign up for to run it. There's a coffee shop upstairs. Students are learning business skills through that, which is highly motivating in terms of courses that students will take. We have more internships. Students can intern in the central office. We've actually had several interns in the communications department this year. Um, those kinds of opportunities that kids can see relevance for their future job prospects and college applications in have been really motivating for kids to take on. So uh, we see a, we see a lot of of that students really thinking about what's my future and what do I want to be interested in and advocacy our civics day and eighth grade civics projects have gotten kids really interested in advocacy and change. You've met some of them at Fine Committee, so. Uh, <laughs> Like, we're really proud of that because it gets them really revved up and excited about getting involved when they get to high school. And then you see more participation in um, student governance and those sorts of things. The high school's also added to no cut sports over the last couple of years, um, mm -hmm. over in winter, mm -hmm. um, which makes it a little bit kind of the activation. So you are looking for an account appropriation of $96,521,248, correct? Any other final questions about the FY25 budget, Chuck? Thank you, Madam Chair. So <clears throat> um, you're asking for a big increase. And I think that uh, our chairman just noted that, 90, 90 some million dollars. And um, my recollection is in the five-year plan, um, or your, your strategic plan, that the, the cumulative increase is on the order of $47 million, more than would be spent if you didn't have that plan. And um, I'm wondering, and we're looking at this, uh, as, as Len pointed out before, we're looking at, um, in 2027, a shortfall. How are you going to tell us as a community, maybe this is the question for you, Dr. Owen, but also for the school committee. How, how are you going to tell us as a community that we're meeting the objectives of this strategic plan and that we should continue funding it this year and next year and next year? So, so I'll describe sort of our mechanism, our process, and then hand it off to my folks, um, colleagues here. So um, we have a reporting structure that uh, each year, I develop goals for the district for the following year. Um, those are based in the strategic plan uh, and then report out on the goals from the previous year. And we'll be using the metrics articulated in the strategic plan. So like for each priority area we have and each initiative, was this successful or not? What's the metric we're using to determine whether this was successful or not? Some of those will shift if we have a better metric, one that's more specific to the actual initiative that we're developing. And one of our, some of our initiatives say, we need a metric for this. So year one is establish a metric. Year two is once you've got a baseline, identify what your metric is that shows whether or not this is successful and then report mm -hmm. back on that. So there's an expectation built into this plan on transparency as to whether or not we're meeting the goals and objectives of it. And, and we'll see that in the community. Yes. Thank you. All right, shifting to the FY24 budget, you've all received that memo from the town manager and the superintendent asking for a reserve transfer of 400,000 into the FY24 budget. Uh, first, I will ask the school side, if, is there anything else you wanna to add to that memo? From not from what was already provided in last week. Any questions that anyone has on the finance committee about that? Yeah. Has the money already been spent? Yes, it's 
with being spent on salaries. Any other questions? All right. Um, thank you very much. This has been very informative and I appreciate the hard work and especially getting the budget to us uh, <laughs> the way you did under very trying circumstances. I know I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. For your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank God. Let's knock off the minutes. There's three. 13th be 18th and 20th. Starting with March 13th? Yes. This is when the town manager was in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this was there had there was the outstanding um, item about um, whether the transportation infrastructure fund funded the entirety of the blue bikes or how we wanted to word that. Um, and it is to fund the entirety of the blue bikes. Um, I spoke to the manager and and reaffirmed that it is for the bikes. Um, his, his thinking was that 23,000 would just drop in the, in the bucket and to do any road work or sidewalk repair, and that he'd rather use this money rather than general funds on the Dubai program. So that is his plan. So anyone have any other questions or revisions to the um, minutes of March 13th? And we've already noted the um, Article 55 reward with that. Was that in these minutes? <coughs> no, no, it was the Article 55 command or office plans to request no action. Do you know what number, number it is? Article 10, 55. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. I think we covered that before we got where they are. To request. Buy. No action. No action. Okay. It, I'm sorry, was there a change that was supposed to be made here? No. Yes. Town manager office plans to request no action in our Oh, yes. Okay. So you got that. Yes. All right. All right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the 15th? So moved. Second. 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 All right. All in favor, raise your hand. Sixteen. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Right. Yes. Okay. Next. Yes. Um, page two, Article fifty. Yes, uh, Rebecca. Uh, we did not vote. Yes, that. noted that. So that is struck in. Any other corrections or additions to the minutes of the evening? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right, all in favor, raise your hand. Sixteen. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Yes. And lastly, and this this already has a correction from Alan Jones, which is number five C, 
which is the figure for the liability insurance. So that was changed to $607,703. Any other revisions to the 20th? Minister the plan. All right, is there a motion? Move. Seconded. Second. All right, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Fifteen. Any affirmative and opposed abstentions. Jordan. All right. Yep, we're done. Let's take up the school budget. So would you go back? Is there a motion? I move that we accept the budget as is. Second. Second. All right. Discussion. None. All right, all in favor of approving the school appropriation of the amount of $96,521,248. Raise your hand. Sixteen. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Yes. Let's take up the four hundred thousand dollar reserve transfer request. Move approval. <coughs> Second. All right. Any discussion? I have a question. Oh. I guess on the timing of this, why were we hearing about it now and not? We did hear about it. Did we did hear about it. Like no, no, no. I mean, I knew the issue was yeah. wrong, but in terms of the actual request for the transfer. We knew that. We um, argued about this. The, well, well, but wouldn't you have requested the transfer? What I'm asking is, would you have requested it within six months? Ago? It wasn't certain what yeah. pool of money would be available. So as we've gotten closer to the end of the school year. Um, also, where the funding was coming from, the reserve fund was always a possibility. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, you were saying might have come. From... So, as a matter of finance committee policy, um, for for every department, what we what we've always said to them when they've had overruns is do your best to manage it down, and then tell us where we are at the end of it. So I remember one year, um, it was the police or fire budget. I think it was the police budget. We knew was over budget like the first month because they had a an incident and so but instead of just giving us money we're like okay we've kind of got it in the reserve fund we know it's kind of like informally earmarked there but that doesn't mean you have carte blanche to just spend 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 away and so the school needs to be subject to the same standard they ever have on the same standards and so even though the school knows about it like really early they still have to make an attempt to manage they still have to manage their money through <laughs> right they can't be like hey we need this 400 grand and oh Oh, and then we need two more. And then we need to be like, it's gonna, you gotta manage all the way through when we get to the end, then it's there. That's why, just to keep everyone sort of consistent that they've managed their money. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who else has anyone else? Charlie? <clears throat> I, I, I thought that this uh, reserve fund was supposed to be used for emergencies. Um, I, think, I think there's some language to that effect in the, in the Bible, if I remember, but not positive. And, um, this wasn't an emergency. I mean, they, they knew they they went ahead and spent this money when they knew they weren't going to get it in the in the old right. I'll cost me money. No. Actually, emergency is not in the statute. It's unforeseen or extraordinary. And so I guess you could argue that the school committee, it was unforeseen when they developed the budget and it was passed by town meeting that what was the override last November? November. Yeah. yeah. So that it was unforeseen that the override would fail and that it, the wording was wrong. Or sorry, that the override passed, but that the wording was wrong in the question. Um, so I, I think it would qualify for that. I'm sort of interested though, Dean, what do you think? Should we wait until June with all the other transfers to give them the 400? Or should we, um, should we say that we anticipate that any monies left over in the school budget at the end of the year will be turned back to uh, the general fund? 
Well, no, so I think it's fine to give it to them now because one of the interesting mechanics of unique mechanics of the school budget is by about October 1st, you know where they're going to end the year because um, teachers don't turn over mid year, right? So, like a teacher doesn't start on September 1st and then resign to take another teaching job on January 1st. You, you can pro forma out and project where they're going to land like really early. Um, and so at this point, they know that's where they're going to land. And historically, if you look at like their money, they don't they don't usually go over. Um, they usually don't come in very far under either. Like it's just they've projected out and they go. So I mean, whether we do it now or we do it then, we're just gonna we're gonna land at the same place. Anything else? Though? Annie and Dara. Just just to add that I think that um, given the other things that we have used the reverse reserve fund transfers in the past, it just qualifies. Um, I, I know that we've used revert, reserve fund transfers to cover things like the cost of retirements and so on and so forth, but as far as I'm concerned, could have been anticipated and budgeted for and weren't. So um, it just seems to me like we're not in unusual territory with this particular. Yeah. What's the balance for the reserve fund? Uh, Two million. Yeah. Uh, there's plenty of money there. Yeah. <laughs> and I have spoken to um, the town manager and the deputy, and they, I asked them what other contingencies may be out there um, by the end of the year, and they think that we could fund those contingencies. Plus the four hundred thousand still have money to come back. Yeah. So we didn't ask them this, but I suspect that there's some additional costs that they've had to absorb in their budget. For example, the electricity costs, which we know is based on the calendar year and not the fiscal fiscal year, and we know we've seen a big increase. So I'm, you know, I, I suspect there are places that they've had to move things around. You know, but having but knowing from the beginning that there was sort of this explicit commitment for the additional 400,000, but knowing that they couldn't ask for more and they have to, you know, shift things around. And, and, and I'll just say that I was in a meeting where there was a, at least one select board member, if not two, who made the explicit promise, you'll get this money right. somehow. So it wasn't as if the school committee and schools department went off on just saying, we're going to do it. Um, they, 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 they were given some um, surety that the town would fund what was a mistake in the wording of the override. Al Jones. Just a comment. Since this isn't the Warren article, it's probably not going to be discussed at town meeting. So I guess my request is that we put something in the finance. If article. we pass it, it'll be in there. It is an explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right. Is there a motion to approve a reserve transfer? Okay. It's on the table. It's on the table. All right. All right. All in favor, raise your hand. Sixteen. All opposed? Any extensions? Unanimous. Madam Chair? Yes, Charlie. Did you just say that it, it is a Warren article? It is a Warren article. So uh, if it is a Warren article, it's not going to, if, if we rely on the Warren article to get them the money, they're not going to get it until after July 1st, maybe six weeks later when, when it's, I think when it gets Certified state. Wait, what is this a reserve fund? So, so it should be a reserve fund. Yeah. I don't think it's the adjust FY24 article. This is just a reserve fund transfer. Yeah. I can I can clarify if you want. There there is an article in case you guys didn't do the reserve fund transfer. So what article then? Okay, hold on one second. So the, the alternative source would be to 
uh, appropriate that money from the override stabilization fund during this FY or so on. So I'm going to take the position that we just voted on the reserve fund transfer. Yeah, and I'd like to move no action on Article 38. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Next is the prudent investment article. Yeah. 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 This is article 56. You try to try 56. Fifty-six. 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 Fifty-six.
Andy's concerned that we don't have a any formal oversight process. I also don't think we should be the first out of the gate on this new state rule. I think we, it wouldn't hurt to wait a year or two to see what towns get out there and do it and how successful they are and who the successful um, financial advisors are uh, in this process. You know, they, they mentioned, I think it was Rockland, but you know, there may be other, they, 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 they may be good or they may not be good. It'd be good to see what, what firms are successful with this process. And then finally, and this is not an ad hominem comment or an ad feminine comment, but our treasurer is new. And this is a big job uh, that she has. And she needs to sort of you know, uh, have some time in the saddle. So I think that uh, postponing it a year and while well, she's dealing with all the other um, intricacies of that job is, is not a bad idea. That's, that's why I'm in favor of not doing it this year. Um, the, uh, thank you. Um, the um, one thing I asked for was sort of a long-term analysis of the relative performance. What we got was a five-year comparison from Rockwell Trust who's trying to sell this. Uh, it looks pretty good in the last five years, but the last five years have been pretty good. What I wanted to know is <laughs> if we've done this in 2008 or 2007, what would happen? A, a long enough cycle to see you know, some real stock market cycles to compare, you know, risk and conservative. I, I know if this was my money, I wouldn't invest on, on based on this. So I, I agree. I think we should delay it and get some more data. I want to find out what's the potential re likely return versus the likely risk. Thank you. Uh, I'll talk to you. Um, I agree with all of you. Uh, just not sure which way I'm going to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. That's I uh. <clears throat> Looking at the legal list that exists now, it's basically a bunch of uh, uh, large cap companies, you know, uh, and a bunch of uh, mutual funds for government securities, bond, bonds and government securities. So that, that's it. And I think the uh, trust fund commissioner should have more flexibility. I mean, you know, they might want to just stick 60% of the money in a 500 index fund and, and let it ride. Uh, that, but there's no there's no mutual funds in there. There's, there's it, it, it's not really all that great. Um, so I think that we should go in this direction. Um, but as been said, maybe not now. Uh, the treasurer is new. She's very good, but she's new. Her background isn't in, in treasury management. Um. And so um, I looked at the investment policies, one's from 2015, uh, one's from 2020, and they're fine. But, um, uh, you know, it doesn't, I'd like to see something that says, well, we're going to put 50% in bonds and 50% in equities or, or something like that, you know, what, what, what their intentions are. Um, so depending on which way the wind blows in the next few speakers, mm. I think my inclination would be to vote no, but to request specific things. Like we want an updated investment policy from the Board of Trust Fund Commissioners uh, stating what, what how they foresee this going, what percentages they want to put in, uh, signed off by the treasurer, um, and, um, and the manager. So uh, anyway, those are my thoughts. All right, John. Going to sway everybody now. <laughs> no pressure, so first, but... uh, I agree with Charlie that you know this may probably not something you want to be first out of the gates on, and also maybe just coming behind Jennifer when she said the market is so high is really a great time to put money in the market. Who knows? But along with that, interest rates are very high, and it's not that hard to make a lot of money off interest. And I believe at one of the meetings, Alex said that that uh, our revenue is up. You know, significantly because interest rates are high. So kind of like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, do they really need another tool right now where they're just putting the money in interest-bearing accounts and getting a pretty good return? So I would say kind of leave it as is okay. for now. So I, I would agree with the consensus to not vote on it this year. I'll, I'll I agree mostly with how Charlie said it, but I'll say it so slightly differently. Um, I would look at it as whether new or not that you know the finance committee does have some ability here too. I would almost phrase it as protect the treasurer, right? 
Um, so one of the things you learn when you have to do that function is there are competing interests in the town. So the treasurer is the custodian of funds and she's ultimately responsible for making the decisions. The library trustees go over those earning statements in nauseatingly painful detail every month. Um, and the trust fund commissioners don't have the same risk as the um, professional treasurer are usually a little more like, in, like they're, they're not as adverse to risk as the treasurer would be, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera, kind of ripples down the line. And, and I think, you know, what the treasurer has to contend with is these, these different thoughts that trust fund commissioners might want to go one way, the library trustees are looking at it a different way. There's, there's, there's a mess, right? Because all these different groups have money in this one pot, right? So the money's in the pot and then it gets, you just figure out whose percentage is what and all that. And um, why I say protecting the treasurer is I think we make, without, if there's not a policy to make a shift and a plan to make the shift, you then just, all the noise just collapses onto one person. And now you've just made one person's job really painful. And they're having to battle it without the wedge, right? By voting no, we empower that position to say, no, can't make the changes here, but you all have a lot of work to do. So get your pencils out, sharpen them up, write up some plans, and let's have them approved and ready to go by the next time town meeting meets. If that next time is in the fall and they get their work done by September 1, you could do it in a fall special. If not, it can go to the spring, but it's not, it's not a, a no, we don't like it. It's yeah. a no, like we're not ready and we're not going to set one professional individual up to bear the brunt of all of this. Uh, I'd like to make a motion of no action uh, with the proviso to be added to the comments that we request that the uh, treasurer and the uh, trust fund commissioners, I guess all three trust fund commissioners, all uh, develop an investment policy specifically for these funds uh, with their plans and intentions over the next year uh, to be signed off by the town manager. And uh, when that policy is is set, you know, we'll, um, we'll re relook at this next time. Can you add an oversight? Yeah, I'm just going to say that. Andy oversight, yeah. yeah. Well, who do you want to have oversight? Well, let them come up with an oversight. They need an oversight okay, process. Okay, the development the process. process. Develop the development oversight process. Oversight process. process. Yeah, that includes reporting at a public meeting of the select board. Um, right. Some periodic basis. Whatever. Let them come up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Second. Okay. Oh, well, he said the town manager signs off, or the town treasurer signs off. No, the, the, the town treasurer is down here. But okay. In fact, even in the you other thing, it okay. goes to the manager. He has to sign off on it, too. All right, well, I think the comments to be about the treasurer. That convinced me. <clears throat> treasurer, finance director, manager. Tanner, any other questions on this? Second By the way, you don't invest when the market's high. <laughs> By low All right, so there's been a motion that's been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right. Yeah, no, no action. This is no action without prejudice. <laughs> Advice. All right, I want to revisit collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. Something came up. Uh, there's a potential, however small, but a potential that there may be some agreements that can be reached by the end of town meeting. Um, so that and being able to set aside a salary reserve um, um, makes it um, important that we keep our 65 alive. Mm. Um, so, to reconsider. there's a motion to reconsider. Second. Okay. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Um, opposed? All right, so um, my suggestion is that we uh, report on 65 <laughs> at some. Um, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor 
Yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? And because that will still be outstanding, I think we have to also report on our purposes for which is uh, this possibility uh, they would they can find. Oh, sorry, which one? The uh, so the overall stabilization fund. Yeah, since we don't. So, so we're probably talking about a million dollar difference. That's higher than the theme Carmen rule. Um, I don't cap that year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, all in favor of reporting at town meeting on Article sixty four. That's a motion. All right. So Second. Motion. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. So I think we have. Completed everything. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Question, Madam Chair. A <laughs> um, couple of things, though. Um, <laughs> Alan Jones, when do you think you will have something to circulate? Because we have to do, I want everyone to check their numbers and the headcounts. Right. And I'm, I'm in the final reviews with Alex, we've been finding, you know, $22 here, maybe, you know, $13 there or whatever, but it all needs to add up. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. But we'll still, and, yeah, just we still so, want to get it out to everybody. So, so you know, I, I, I like to have everything add up around the yellow blotches. So, I'm thinking late this week. It depends on when Alex gets back to me and some updated. And we are going to the printers Thursday of next week. Of next, of next week. Of next week. Yeah. Um, right. Or a Tuesday or Wednesday. If it's second or third, I thought. Um, I thought it was. Oh, okay. Thursday. Well, th yeah, Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, so everybody can expect before the weekend, hopefully more like Wednesday or Thursday, to get a, a preliminary copy of Appendix B and C, and I just ask everybody to look at them and confirm. Check the numbers, check the head counts. And if you could do that by Monday, that would be very helpful. Then we can. Um, so, I'm sorry, we're going to get these this week. Later this week? Yeah. Okay. You're getting your discrepancy fixes from Alex, you know, and for us to provide. Uh, but many of them are the old are the old fashioned, you know, these okay. two spreadsheets that are supposed to be talking to each okay. other don't. So uh if well can I go? Wait, oh, Charlie. Charlie. Yes, the so, chair. So how yes, how do we uh, what what five year plan do we put in? in appendix so D or something? Yeah, I had that same question, also appendix C. Um, yeah. I, you know, just to make everything balanced, I think what we're probably, I don't need to talk to you about it. Probably what we want to do is to put in zero for the collective bargaining and, and put in a number in Appendix C to balance the budget with sufficient footnote. I, I didn't need to talk to you about how to handle that. Where would we put the number to balance the budget? Well, fiscal statements here. If, if if we if we if we knew a number within the theme carbon tolerance that we could vote tonight on sixty five, then we could increase the override stabilization fund allocation and then tweak it later. Mm -hmm. But um, in other words, in Appendix C, I, I can't put a question mark. I mean, I I, I could, but it requires some explaining. But usually. It's balanced. I mean, the, the long range plan that's Appendix D and the one page summary it's Appendix C should have a zero at the bottom. And which means we have to have solid numbers. And the only solid number I can think of is zero with, you know, knowing that that may change. And uh, uh, and then maybe on the floor of town meeting, in, once we know the numbers, we can hand out a new Appendix C and a new append Appendix D, a new long range plan and a new. One pager. I'm not sure. Um, I'm just looking at April. Uh, Patriot stays the 15th. I'm assuming that House Ways and Means Committee reports out on the 10th. Do you have any sense? Have you heard? Okay. Usually, because what they do is they report out on the Wednesday, the 10th, or Wednesday, that, and then Patriot Day, everybody's skirt skirting around trying to make amendments to the budget. And then they start um, They start after that, the week after that, actually voting. So yeah. 
hopefully by the 10th, we'll have some sense of what House Ways and Means is going to do. And maybe we should schedule a meeting for the uh, 10th to, we to do, do all these last little things. But we still need to get the report out. That's what, right. that's what we're struggling with. I mean, frankly, the, the getting it out next week is, is relatively early. I mean, I think they're, they're, you know, they're retracting the schedule. And, and the fallback is we mail it out and pay the postage ourselves. So, but yeah, so that that's an option. Yeah, but what, what are we waiting for? I mean, we, I don't want to be in a situation of last year, right. right? Having things not on the consent agenda. So I'd like to get, and it's just easier and cheaper for us to let the select board yeah. mail it out. So if, if all we're dealing with is what to do with the salary reserve, well, so, okay, so I, we've moved to, we've, we've approved reconsideration of 65, but I think maybe we should <clears throat> finish the report as if we hadn't, with zero for the salary reserve and zero everything out based on that without voting on the fiscal bill. How about, how about putting it in the reserve fund, finance committee reserve fund, jack it up by a million dollars or something like that. Whatever comes out, we take it out of that. And that way, at least we've got a, an expense level that's in the right. It, it's not going to kill us. You know, normally we have a 1% reserve fund. So if it turned out to be 0.9%, because the what we, what we throw into the settlement is uh, so what? It won't hurt. On the other hand, if, if it turns out that they don't settle, we can actually lower the reserve fund in town meeting, we put it into the override stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. But if they don't settle, we still got to set some money aside. All right. Well, we put it into the other article. Yeah. So it's, it's whether it's settled or whether it's not settled, we still have to have the same amount of money set aside for collective bargaining. Thank you. See? So I, I think Alan's probably dead on, right? Like, I think if we're weighing our, our struggles, like our issue is um, getting the town meeting book. Getting the town meeting budget book out on time, the town finance report out on time, so we don't have people holding every of our articles right. on the consent agenda, which was troubling last year. So we want to avoid that. And the, the, the offset to that is what Alan said that we fund it as if we didn't reopen it, and we have to make an administrative adjustment when the budget comes up, or we have to put out a supplemental like sheet that says this changes, right? I think that path is okay because I think the alternative which we went through we're trying to avoid. And so if Alan just pushes the budget through as if we didn't reopen it for his tables, that's fine. And if something were to change, it would be I think very easy for you to stand on the floor tell me and say we have a sheet or we sent up we send out a sheet and then you just announce like that's these that's changes have been made, we're done. It's easy. It's just trying to make a logical finance committee report with the numbers adding up. That's all. We we absolutely come May when this comes up, we can we can do I can do with that. On the, I mean, we, can have, we can have an agenda and we can send that. right. So the amendment would be the article Article sixty five, the uh, article that appropriates from the override fund, and Appendix C and Appendix D. But don't we want? But we want something. Now, don't we? Don't we want well, something? that's why I, I'm, I'm proposing we. It's as if Alex had never mentioned it, or so he mentioned zero it three reserve. weeks from now, and zero. we didn't. We weren't reconsidering. So we put in zero. We put in the three million dollars from the override fund, and then amend that, and it's like three pages of paper. But they must know some kind of money. They're getting three point two five percent increase. They spent this. Anything left over is there's a number that Alex is, thinks it will be the salary reserve. So we have we have a number. Yeah, is that the, when many, he says the number was right, was that the 1,107,282 that yeah. is in the master plan? Yeah, with the long rate. Yeah, so we, we, we could, yeah. we could vote the number that is in his master budget right now, which goes back to the $4 million from the over. Uh, and then if it isn't spent, it goes to free cash or something. So there's, there's sort of two approaches. If, if, if we think it's either that number or nothing. Pretty good with the rest of it so far. Yeah. We don't want to put the exact amount that would 
that he thinks it is the, if the negotiation is still ongoing, right. but we can put something close. And I will say that this past Sunday at our service, I had two town meeting members who know I'm on the finance committee come up to me and say, when are you going to have your report this year? <laughs> so that was a big deal. Um, so they don't want to I'm all for jury rigging it so that it works. And right. dealing well, so we just got to get clarity on what are we doing 64 and 65. We are, we had voted no action on them. We've, we're going to report on at the town meeting on 64 and 65. Okay. So I just want to make sure that it doesn't go into the consent agenda, even though it looks like, right. It, it well, that's, a, that's a negotiation, right? Yeah. So right. The, the only issue, the only thing we're talking about is the numbers so that we have in our finance committee report that's being sent out a balanced budget. Um, Annie? So I would suggest that we put a million dollars into Article 65, which is close to what the anticipated amount is, and then we put whatever into the appropriation for the Fiscal Stability and Stabilization Fund, and then we make Dean's motion, and then I think we'll be so close that you guys can modify those numbers, you know, when we get to, like, in an addendum or whatever, without us coming back to take the vote. But it still wouldn't be in the report, would it? I mean, it wouldn't be on paper. Well, unless unless the, they finalize it this week. Right, which isn't going to happen. I get you, which isn't going to happen. What I'm saying is that you guys write that addendum without necessarily. Well, by, by then, yeah. we'll be meeting in town meeting and we'll have a meeting before. Yeah. So okay. That's, again, that that's just, my mind. I, I guess we just use zero. I, I think it's cleaner to do that and then change it if we have to, as opposed to, well, maybe it's going to be this or this, and then we'll fiddle one way or the other. Okay. Alan? Okay. Um, so. Well, I guess. The, the, making the final couple of numbers come together, that's that's quick. I mean, that's a two minute job. Going through all of B and making sure that line item after line item by everybody here, that takes time. So my suggestion is just send the budgets out, have everybody take a look at their budgets and anything else they want yeah. to do. Oh, yeah. That'll be done by everybody gets in, say in a week. Um, and then you're gonna send the, war, the rest of the finance committee out to, to research. And if we set aside a meeting of the 10th, which is a Wednesday night, um, and then if House Ways and Means Committee comes up with something significant, the way Paul thought it would be, we can make the final adjustments on the 10th. It goes to print Thursday morning. No, um, that, no that's the problem. It's it due with the select board on the 8th, Yeah, Monday the 8th. So we have to go to the printer like Thursday before. Yeah, before. About a week from today. I, you know, we, we shouldn't be run by the selectmen's we have to find out what the House Ways and Means Committee is going to do. But they give us another five hundred thousand that changes everything. Yeah, and but but again, we're, as we've heard, how many members want the report? And they well, want the report. it'll be available electronically on the on the eleventh, and by print on the twelfth. It was available yeah, last it year. Change change it, it, it doesn't change everything. It only changes the stabilization. I don't think we're going to throw money around if we get another half a million. No, we're not going to throw money around. It's going to be. It's just we're just going to drop the yeah. stabilization fund by five hundred or three. We're going to do that. Anyway. All right, we, we'll use zero, um, okay. and and then we'll get the report out, um, and then when we get a better sense of all of those figures, we can amend it on yeah. um, time four. Um, do we need to rezone anything? No, I think it's, it's a still placeholder. Real report. I think zero. I, I, think, yeah, I think zero leave it the way it is. And then if something happens in the first, you know, the next FinCon meeting, we vote a couple of numbers and do whatever papers we need to hand yeah. out. Um, all right. So um, there's a chance maybe I'll call a, if we need it, to call, I'll call a meeting between. Next week in the start of how many needed, I'll entertain a Dean Carmen motion, hopefully to avoid him to do any of that. Um, so take it away, Dean. So I move that in the course of creating the budget book, if the officers of the committee find any accounts are out of balance for administrative reasons, that committee authorizes them to fix it in the book without having to come back to the committee for approval. Second. Second. 
Is there a dollar amount attached to that? Nope. We trust them that we know where they live. <laughs> I mean, usually the things that happen is the salary sheets don't match the summary sheet. And I just have to go back to Alan and say which one's right. right. Is there a second to that motion? Second. All, right. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, attend precinct meetings um, if you can. Um, shoot, I haven't done yet. Um, I can follow, follow up on that. that. Yeah. Um, and just some news, Brian Beck is resigning. He just doesn't, he's had some health and family issues. So we did his best to resign. So Brian, Brian Beck. Mm -hmm. So he is in precinct five. five. And this five. is that where five. you live, Brian. Yeah. So we have precinct well, five. Forward. What? Yeah. I'm a floater, I'm in the floor. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have have as of next year. We need precinct two. So we need precinct two, and we need which precinct are you representing now? It was eighteen. Or eighteen. Right. So, um, so, um, so just so you know, um, Brian was um, a contributor, um, and he will be missed. And I'm sorry, the circumstances prevent him from continuing. Can we get him to come to the year end party? I reckon that he should. <laughs> He, he should uh, know he's invited. Let him know. Yeah. Anything else that anyone has? We're free. <laughs> We're free. Yeah. <laughs> For a little bit. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. Yes. All right. All in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.